so um, it's a, this is a basic diffraction talk, right? So it, 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 I expect it will be review for some number of, of folks who are, have spent more time studying diffraction. And if, if that's true, I, I apologize, but I, I found I had to hear this stuff several times before it sank in. And um, even if you're already uh, cognizant of the concepts that I talk about, I hope you'll uh, appreciate seeing the teaching software that uh, I've been developing over the years. And, and there have been some recent additions for teaching uh, serial femtosecond crystallography that uh, Mike Daly, who's uh, sitting back there, has recently implemented as a part of the BioXFEL contribution to the to the to the program. So, if you're if you're learning, I hope it'll be helpful. Or if you're teaching, I hope uh, learning about the tool will be helpful in your uh, teaching efforts. So I, the, I'm going to talk first a little bit of, about the the theory of the Ewald sphere construction and how it helps us understand the diffraction patterns that we measure. And then I'm going to go to the simulator and uh, show you some uh, uh, graphics representations of the concepts um, that I found really helpful when I was uh, uh, learning this. And I, I turned them into a graphics program. So the, the, the graphics program is called X-Ray View. And it's been through several, well, we're up to version 5 now with the SFX contribution. So it, it's still evolving. And I would like to invite comments anybody has, good or bad, about how it works. And um, there's also, if, if you like it, there's an opportunity for, for you to devise new exercises that I could add to the catalog that you think uh, would, be, would be helpful. So I would like to think of X-Ray View as now being a product of the uh, BioXFEL community. And the, the more people that participate in making it better, that's, that, that's good. It, I think it's something we can uh, uh, be, be proud of at the, at the center for helping to, to teach about fundamentals of, of crystallography and so on. So now I'm going to go to the PowerPoint slides and talk a little bit. Are we good on the slide now? Somebody? Yes. That is. OK. So um, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, talk about diffraction from lattices and where the reciprocal lattice com comes from. And then we'll look at examples of the reciprocal lattice uh, with the simulator. So I, uh, I sort of developed this from for uh, teaching my uh, structural biology uh, class, uh, uh, starting with the definition of lattice and what diffraction is, and then how the diffraction of a lattice uh, manifests itself. So uh, lattices are typically uh, defined by uh, uh, re repeating vectors. In the case of a one-dimensional lattice, you might have some vector A uh, shown uh, shown here, and repeated application of vector A in one dimension results in some resultant total vector R, which is some integer times A, uh, just to get you used to this sort of nomenclature of which node you're talking about and the length of the, of the, of the vector. So um, using the, the standard uh, Fourier summation representation of the scattering. The scattering uh, from the nth atom, assuming that you have an origin here at the beginning of the first vector, the scattering of the nth atom, since the since r, uh, s dot r is the normal equation up, up here. So if you've got some integer times s dot the initial vector, this would be the scattering from a one-dimensional uh, lattice, right? So given any scattering vector s, you can calculate the structure factor uh, 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 and uh, at a particular point in. Okay, so uh, uh, 
where f, f sub n here is a is a for our purposes a scalar term which is the strength of the scattering, right? This is this is called the scattering factor, which is sometimes confused with the structure factor, which is this complex number. But the, uh, try to keep them straight. The scattering factor is the strength of the scattering, which is a, a scalar term as long as you don't have so-called anomalous scattering. So then the, the scattering from from many unit cells, which is just the, the sum of the contributions of the scattered waves from each of the individual ones is just this summation uh, where n varies from minus n to n. That would be the length of your, uh, the total length of your, of your lattice. And so you'd have uh, 2n plus 1 terms contributing to the total um, uh, structure factor. Now I have to figure out how to advance the slides. There we go. So, um, so I, I, I often develop the interference in, in lattices uh, mathematically with this with the following sort of example. So if you have a structure factor f of s, which is the sum of all these contributions from the individual scatterers, just just because it's a nuisance right now, I'm going to assume that this scattering factor is one for all the atoms because it, uh, it makes the, the algebra at least look simpler. So if, if you write out this summation from minus n to n, you have a bunch of terms like this, right? So you have little n, which is up here in the complex exponent, uh, you know, being negative n all the way up to zero to 1, 2, 3, and, and so on from minus n to n. And I'd like to ask students, what kind of series is this? This is a series where each term is consecutively multiplied by another, by another term, right? It's like to the first, to the second, to the third, whatever. And you know, what kind of uh, series is this, right? And uh, sometimes I actually get the right uh, uh, answer. This is a... Uh, uh, geometric series, and you may remember from uh, freshman algebra or maybe even high school that there's a formula for the sum of the geometric series as a function of the ratio between the terms and the first term and, and uh, the number of terms, right? So uh, geometric series can be written like this, so then all we have to do is um, assign for our geometric series, what the ratio is, the number of terms, and the t, and then we can have a simplified expression for the uh, uh, structure factor from from a lattice. So for our so for our lattice, here, here's our the expression we're trying to sum up again. Here's here's the uh, formula for identical scatterers, right? So I plugged in. Um, uh, the ratio, the ratio of the terms, the the, the number of terms fits in uh, here, and then the the uh, uh, and let me go back just a second. I've lost the person. There it is. Okay. So again, you you've got the the first the first term. Here's the two n two n term and there's the ratio term. So uh, so it, 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 it looks something like this, right? Now uh, this expression can be simplified algebraically. Uh, if you multiply the top and the bottom by this, then you get a, an expression something like this. And th these, should, these kinds of terms should start to look familiar because from Euler's formula, uh, uh, you can show that e to the ix minus e to the minus e to the minus ix, uh, the cosine terms drop out, and you're left with 2i sine x, right? Given given this definition of the complex exponential, so we can uh, apply that, and then we get uh, a, a formula like this. It's a it's a sine some uh, integer pi s dot a over sine pi s dot a. So now we have an expression that will let us look at the effect of the length of the lattice. And, and th this is important uh, 
to those of us in BioXFL because we're not always under the uh, situation where we assume an infinite lattice. If you have a finite lattice, then you don't get complete uh, destructive interference between the spots, and so this this formula nicely illustrates that feature. So if we have some uh, uh, scattering factor now that, that sort of falls off as a function of scattering angle, that's typically what they do because the electrons are in a cloud and not in a point, we can start to plot this as a function of various uh, lattice um, uh, uh, sizes. So if, if, for instance, we put in three, that would be three unit cells, then you get something like this where you have uh, 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 these uh, diffraction maxima starting to concentrate at values where s dot a is an integer, but you have uh, less than complete cancellation in between, um, and uh, uh, the, the main thing here is that even with small lattices, you, you start to see um, these uh, maxima come up where s dot a is, is, an, is, a, is an integer, where s is uh, the scattering vector, which is uh, 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 the incident minus the diffracted ray direction. Okay, but as, as n gets bigger and bigger, things start to sharpen up. And if, if, if as, as uh, capital N goes to a very large number, the, these would actually become delta functions. And then you have uh, the case where the, the width of the spots is determined by things other than the, than the size of the lattice. But the, 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 the upshot of this is that using this formula, you can naturally see that S dot A must be an integer to see diffraction when you have a when you have a largish crystal, okay. And so there's s dot a one. There's a little blip there for two. Um, s, it, the, the thing is non-zero for large lattices anytime s dot a is not an integer. So from the uh, 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 Taylor book, you can see. Graphically, this sort of effect, if I have an array of dots like this uh, with five, you see sharp lines starting to appear. Maybe it's not quite perfect canceling out in between because we only have five. If I had rows of dots arrayed the other way, the diffraction pattern would be oriented in this direction. And then here's an example of a small crystal where the, the diffraction of this lattice uh, has simultaneously requirements that s dot a be an integer and s dot b also be an integer. And uh, the upshot of, of this is that the diffraction pattern of a lattice is another, is another uh, lattice. And it's, uh, the, the length of the vectors in this lattice is uh, 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 reciprocally related to the length of the of the uh, uh, vectors that make up the uh, reciprocal lattice. And again, you see, because it's a finite crystal, you see the so-called subsidiary maxima between what we'll start uh, referring to as the, Bragg, as the Bragg peaks. Oops. So, um, I just showed you a picture of a 2D lattice, but let's go back to some of the formal lattice definitions, right? So before we had a 1D lattice represented by a vector A. If we want to talk about a 2D vector, we need a second vector that's not collinear with that one, some vector B. And then uh, R, the position of the atom, is going to be of a particular atom, or a, in, in this case, I have atoms at the nodes of the lattices. They don't necessarily have to be there, but the R value of this node uh, would be Na plus uh, Mb, just by extension from the one-dimensional case. And so now uh, uh, two integers are needed where uh, s dot a has to be an integer, typically labeled h by crystallographers, and s dot b is k. And uh, uh, 
uh, this gives me a chance to talk about the uh, relationship between the real lattice and the reciprocal lattice. Uh, uh, let's define some vectors A star and B star, as crystallographers do, where A dot A star is 1, B dot B star is 1, and A dot B star is 0. So A is perpendicular to B star, and B is perpendicular to A star, right? And so th this is a natural property of the reciprocal uh, uh, lattice, and it, it, it gets more complicated as we get to the three-dimensional case, but the same uh, concept holds, right? So here, here's a simultaneous plot of the, uh, the real and reciprocal lattice. So if, if we had, say, a crystal with these dimensions A and B, uh, the reciprocal lattice that defines the, uh, the location of the maxima uh, in, the in, the, in the structure factors would have this relationship to the real space lattice. They're fixed with respect to each other. And if here you can see a, uh, uh, B, B star perpendicular to, to, to the A vector and A star perpendicular to the, to the, to the uh, B vector. Um, and making these kind of plots is sometimes helpful if you're trying to understand indexing uh, ambiguities or, or uh, other kinds of anomalies on, on a practical basis. So um, we can just sort of do a check here to, to show that S is the allowed diffraction vector and needs integers. So uh, if S dot H equals uh, H, and uh, the standard diffraction formula has H A star plus K B star in the complex exponent. If we dot that with H because of the definition of the reciprocal lattice, dot that with A, then we, then we, then we get an integer. So we, what this means is that uh, diffraction from large crystals is observed only on reciprocal lattice points, which I've said several times, but here you go. So, uh, uh, it's a little harder to show the pictures in 3D, but the same thing holds. Now I just need a third vector, uh, C for the lattice and C star for the reciprocal lattice, and the definition of another index L. And so now the 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 scattering vector S is the sum of three contributions uh, from the A star, B star, and C star axes. And these the relations between real and reciprocal space are straightforward if you have an orthogonal cell. Uh, a and A star uh, have the same direction, and A star equals 1 over A. But things get uh, ugly when you have the, uh, angles that are not uh, 90 degrees everywhere. And so you wind up with a definition that looks like this. A star is defined as B cross C over A dot B cross C. Right? And uh, it's still true that A star is perpendicular to B and C. And, and all the permutations thereof, and A is perpendicular to B star and C star, right? The, uh, and there are uh, scalar uh, representations of these. The, it's always true that the, the volume of the reciprocal unit cell is 1 over volume of the real cell. So that, that winds up being uh, uh, simple. But the actual uh, Relationships of A star, B star, and C star to the real space axes are uh, sometimes not so easy to visualize. Okay, so um, uh, here, here's our structure factor equation again, now for a crystal. So now we're saying that uh, because we're talking about a, an infinite lattice, that the Diffraction only exists at these certain integer triples because we've imposed the boundary condition of a crystal. And so the, the structure factor for a crystal can be reduced to the sum of the some scattering factor uh, terms multiplied by e to the 2 pi h dot x sub j, where x is a vector representing the coordinates of each atom in the unit cell. Because we've imposed, imposed the periodic boundary conditions, you only have to sum over the atoms in one unit cell. And, you know, an alternative way of writing this, and not in vector form, is f as a function of h as a function of h, k, and l, is this expression 
e to the 2 pi i hxj plus k yj plus the c value, l times the c value, where the sum is over all of the unit cell. So we're not, we're not going to talk much more today about the value, uh, the values of f, but rather the, the geometry of the real and reciprocal lattices as they apply to a, a, a diffraction experiment. So uh, uh, before we get to the teaching software, I want to introduce the so-called Ewald sphere. Uh, Ewald was a famous crystallographer in the early uh, 20th century and uh, recognized that this construction was particularly helpful in understanding the geometry of X-ray diffraction experiments. Right? So if you have the if you have the diffraction, the diffracted beam coming in along this line, then what what he showed uh, beautifully was that given given Bragg law, Bragg's law, uh, where one over d equals two sine theta over lambda, and given the the so the von Laue conditions, which are exactly what I said before, s dot a has to be an integer, s dot b has to be an integer, and s dot c has to be an integer all at the same time, he he showed that. Um, with this simple construction, that you have the Bragg's law and the von Laue conditions met when when the, the tip of the scattering vector, which by definition has to end, has to terminate on one of these reciprocal lattice nodes, when that touches a sphere of, of, a, of a certain radius, that corresponds to the geometry when you have a uh, a, a, a source ray coming in at an angle of theta and an exit ray coming out at an angle of theta and a, and a diffracted beam um, appearing on the detector. <coughs> so this is the a two-dimensional view of the so-called uh, uh, evolved sphere uh, uh, construction. Uh, here, here's an, uh, a black and white version showing what, I mean, of course, this is a three dimensional lattice and so not two dimensional. Uh, and so, what I'm going to show you on the software is sort of like what you see here on the right hand side. You have a, you have a sphere, uh, the Ewald sphere, uh, and then you have some sphere that uh, um, bounds the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice, sometimes called a limiting sphere. You know, the crystals only diffract to a certain scattering angle that is a certain resolution. So um, they're going to exist uh, within this sphere. Um, and then when reciprocal lattice points, no matter how you rotate this sphere, when reciprocal lattice points touch this uh, sphere, uh, that's when you have a, a, a diffraction pattern. And uh, you can either you can either uh, scale the, the Ewald sphere by a factor of one over lambda and keep this constant, or you can make the radius of Ewald sphere one and scale the reciprocal lattice by a constant. So all that does is, is blow both of these up together. And, and what what I've done in the software, and you'll see why, is use the Ewald sphere radius of one <clears throat> and scale the reciprocal lattice by lambda. This lets me simulate Lowy photographs quite conveniently um, as well. So let's let's go to the um, uh, to the X-ray view software. Can you see it okay, Bill? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So uh, this this uh, golden orb is meant to be the Ewald sphere. This, we're in so-called goniometer mode right now. You can see, hopefully you can see a, a, a goniometer head. Uh, uh, the software lets you uh, move the move the experiment around. That blue square is representing the detector, right? So you can see the X-rays are coming in from the left, uh, striking a crystal, which is at the center of Ewald's sphere. And there's a, a, a reciprocal lattice here. You can't quite see uh, 
the individual components, but I can go to the uh, uh, go to the unit cell. I can make this unit cell uh, much smaller, and that which of course makes the reciprocal cell bigger, right? I can uh, uh, improve the uh, resolution, which will allow more, more and more spots to be seen. Now you can see uh, 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 that there's a there's a reciprocal uh, uh, lattice. What I've done is when the when a reciprocal lattice point comes within some epsilon uh, value of the of the sphere, I turn the reciprocal lattice point red, and you can see the X-ray beam coming in a spot appearing on the, on the the surface of the detector. Right. So uh, 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 I can. Uh, uh, play games by changing the wavelength. You can see what that does. You can change the uh, uh, the reciprocal lattice parameters, but also you can change the 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 goniometer control. So if I if I rotate the crystal this way, of course it just rotates the pattern because the reciprocal lattice is symmetrical. But if I start changing the uh, this large arc. You can see the reciprocal lattice rotating, and you can see which spots appear on the uh, on the surface of the detector changing. And uh, uh, one one thing, which is, um, let me go back and make the unit cell uh, uh, big, more like a protein again. So you see, um, it, uh, uh, I can just look at the detector if I want to, and now you you can see what's typical of a still diffraction photograph from a crystal. You see these rings. Uh, why do you see rings? That's one of the students. I one of the questions I ask students. You see rings because uh, that's the intersection of a reciprocal lattice plane with a sphere. The, the, when, a, when a plane cuts a sphere, you get a circle, right? So this shows the uh, appearance of uh, these lunes or rings. As I rotate the crystal, you'll see uh, uh, different lunes coming in. This is the y-axis. You can see. Uh, uh, the the different slices of reciprocal space cutting through the Ewald sphere and becoming measurable, right? And uh, you can do things with the software like uh, 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 integrate over a, a range. So now this starts to look like a, a, a rotation photograph, like like a frame you would take at the at the synchrotron, right? You can uh, perform uh, uh, Lowy crystallography experiments. So, so as a reminder, a, a, a Lowy uh, uh, experiment represents the change in uh, uh, a, a change in wavelength. So um, let me If I do a if I do a Lowy photograph, now I'm going to sweep through the wavelength. Let me first just show you the effect of wavelength. So, uh, edit wavelength. Um, as I increase the wavelength, the reciprocal space gets larger, right? So you you see spots getting farther and farther apart on the detector. As I decrease the uh, wavelength, uh, things will appear nearer and nearer the uh, a smaller and smaller scattering angles. So I can do, if I want, I can simulate a, a multi-wavelength uh, Lowy pattern. You can change the starting and ending wavelengths if you want. But now you see things that look very much like um, 
the the data that you see from biocars or from other uh, uh, white or pink radiation experiments, right? In terms of the 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 now instead of rotating the reciprocal lattice, you're shrinking shrinking and swelling it by by changing the uh, wavelength. And um, there are a number of, if you want to pursue this more on your own or consider using it for teaching purposes, you can. Uh, uh, there are a number of exercises here uh, that you can go through. Uh, we haven't added one yet for SFX, but that's next. So uh, uh, this is version. 5.0 beta. We're we're not quite ready to release it yet, but uh, we're uh, we're using some of our BioXFIL resources to update it and include uh, serial femtosecond uh, crystallography. Right. So let me go back to the uh, this other view where you can actually see. See the experiment, and if I if I come up here to uh, mode, where we're in the process of developing, in addition to goniometer mode, where you can slide the fixed crystal around, uh, we have something called injector mode. So the the you know pretty soon there'll be crystals flowing through here, but right now we just have a a, a single crystal, um, and you can uh, it's going to be shown in a bunch of different. Uh, orientations, and we're going to simulate what a, a serial femtosecond crystallography ex experiment uh, 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 looks like. So if, if I just I can just come down here to serial crystal mode, and so this is if you if you if you think of these as simultaneously you know being translated, and every now and then you get a hit. Right, We're, we we want to add something about the hit rate, but here here, uh, you know, spots come and spots come and go, right? They're they're uh, transiently visible. I mean, this this must be a a pretty good size crystal because we're getting a pretty strong diffraction pattern. But they're in, they're in random orientations, and so uh, it's it's difficult to to pick up and to index these things as the people who process data know, but it, it's possible. Okay. So when you're when you're at the beam line though, and you're trying to figure out if you're getting anything or not, uh, you often if, if it's a tiny crystal, you won't see such obvious uh, rings. You might need to integrate uh, a number of different um, uh, uh, views in order to see anything. So we have this. Um, where am I supposed to go? Uh, to turn on the integration. Uh, go to options, auto scatter. Options, auto scatter. Right. Okay. So in in uh, in this case, uh, uh, there's an integration. Integrate. Right. Okay. So this is going to do a hundred hits, and it's going to integrate the pattern, and you, and you'll see what that. Uh, looks like. So now I go back to serial crystal mode. Okay. So uh, uh, now you now there really is uh, uh, something that looks more like what you see in the control room, and you can start to see uh, rings building up corresponding to a powder pattern. Uh, it's really hard to tell from individual photographs when you have a Decent diffraction or not, but if you uh, uh, start to see rings to a certain resolution, you can have confidence that you've got the uh, diffraction that you need with the with the reasonable uh, uh, hit rate. So when this when this is done, we'll change the uh, eye point control, and you can see the see the powder pattern a little better. So you, you can you can definitely see 
the classic crystallographic powder pattern uh, developing here. If we let it, if we let it run, run longer, you can judge what resolution uh, spots you were uh, actually uh, uh, visualizing. So, um, so that's that's pretty much it. I encourage people to to play with it uh, yourself. 